on sickness. Whatever his merits, a man in good health is always disappointing. Impossible to grant any credence to what he says, to regard his phrases as anything but excuses, acrobatics. The experience of the terrible, which alone confers a certain density upon our words, is what he lacks, as he lacks, too, the imagination of disaster, without which no one can communicate with those separate beings, the sick. It is true that if he possessed that experience, he would no longer be in good health. Having nothing to transmit, neutral to the point of abdication, he collapses into well-being, an insignificant state of perfection, of impermeability to death as well as of inattention to oneself and to the world. As long as he remains there, he is like the objects around him. Once torn from it, he opens himself to everything, knows everything, the omniscience of terror. Flesh freeing itself, rebelling, no longer willing to serve. Sickness is the apostasy of the organs. Each insists on going its own way, each suddenly or gradually, refusing to play the game, to collaborate with the rest, hurls itself into adventure and caprice. For consciousness to attain a certain intensity, the organism must suffer and even disintegrate. Consciousness, initially, is consciousness of the organs. In good health we are unaware of them. It is sickness which reveals them to us, which makes us understand their importance and their fragility, as well as our dependence upon them. The insistence with which sickness reminds us of their reality has something inexorable about it. No matter how much we want to forget them, sickness will not permit us to. This impossibility of forgetting, which is the drama of having a body, fills the space of our waking nights. In sleep, we participate in the universal anonymity. We are every being. Once pain rouses us, there is no one but ourselves, alone with our disease, with the thousand thoughts it provokes in us and against us. Woe to this flesh which is at the mercy of the soul, and woe to this soul at the mercy of the flesh. It is in the dead of certain nights that we grasp the entire significance of these words from the Gospel according to Thomas. The flesh boycotts the soul, the soul boycotts the flesh. Deadly to each other, they are incapable of cohabiting, of elaborating in common a salutary lie, a tonic fiction. The more consciousness increases as a consequence of our diseases, the more liberated we should feel. It is the converse which is true. As our infirmities accumulate, we fall victim to our body, whose whims are equivalent to so many decrees. It is our body that commands and controls us. It is our body that dictates our moods. It supervises us, spies on us, keeps us under its thumb, and while we submit to its will and accept so humiliating a servitude, we understand why, in good health, we shrink from the notion of fatality. When our body scarcely troubles to make itself known, we do not perceive its existence in any practical sense. If in health the organs are discreet, in sickness, impatient to call attention to themselves, they enter into competition with each other. The one which most attracts our attention retains this advantage only by a real show of zeal but it exhausts itself in the performance, whereupon another, more enterprising and more vigorous, takes over its role. The irritating thing about this rivalry is that we are obliged to be both its object and its witness. Like every factor of disequilibrium, sickness arouses, whips up and encourages an element of tension and of conflict. Life is an uprising within the inorganic a tragic leap out of the inert. Life is matter animated, and, it must be said, spoiled by pain. From so much agitation, so much dynamism and ado, we escape only by aspiring to the repose of the inorganic, the peace at the heart of the elements, 
The will to return to matter constitutes the very core of the desire to die. On the other hand, to be afraid of death is to fear this return, is to flee silence and the equilibrium of the inert, equilibrium especially. Nothing more normal. It is a question of vital reaction, and everything which participates in life is, in the strict as well as the figurative sense, unbalanced. Each of us is the product of his past ailments, and, if he is anxious, of those to come. The vague, indeterminate disease of being human is joined by others, various and specific, all of which appear in order to inform us that life is a state of absolute insecurity that it is in essence provisional, that it represents an accidental mode of existence. But if life is an accident, the individual is the accident of an accident. There is no cure, or rather we carry inside us all the diseases we have been cured of, and they never leave us. Incurable or not, they are there to keep pain from turning into a diffuse sensation. They stiffen it, organize it, regulate it. They have been called the idée fixe of our organs. Indeed, they suggest organs subject to haunting, unable to escape, subject to oriented, foreseeable confusions, enslaved by a methodical nightmare, as monotonous as an obsession. Such is the automatism of disease that it can conceive of nothing outside itself, Enriched by its initial manifestations, it then repeats itself necessarily, without becoming, however, like boredom, the symbol of invariability and sterility. We must also add that after a certain period, it no longer grants the sufferer anything but daily confirmation of the impossibility of not suffering. So long as we feel well, we do not exist. More exactly, we do not know that we exist. The sick man longs for the nothingness of health, the ignorance of being. He is exasperated to know at every moment that he faces the entire universe with no means of belonging to it, of losing himself within it. His ideal would be to forget everything and, relieved of his past, to wake up one fine day naked before the future. I can no longer undertake anything, starting from myself. Better to explode or dissolve than to continue like this, he tells himself. He envies, scorns, or detests all other mortals, the healthy most of all. Inveterate pain, far from purifying, brings out whatever is bad in the individual, physically and morally alike. A rule of conduct, mistrust the sickly, fear anyone who has been bedridden, the invalid's secret desire is that everyone should be sick, and the dying man longs to see everyone on his deathbed. What we desire in our ordeals is that the others should be as unhappy as we, not more, merely as much. For we must make no mistake, the only equality which matters to us, and also the only one of which we are capable, is an equality in hell. One can dispossess man, one can take everything away from him. He will manage somehow. One thing, however, must not be touched, for if he is deprived of that, he will be unremittingly lost. The faculty, or better still, the ecstasy, of complaining. If you strip him of this, he will no longer take any interest or any pleasure in his ills. He adjusts to them as long as he can talk about them and display them particularly as long as he can narrate them to those around him in order to punish them for not suffering from them, for being momentarily exempt from them. And when he complains, what he is saying is, just wait a little, your turn will come too. You will not escape. All sick men are sadists. But their sadism is acquired. That is their only excuse. to yield, amidst all our diseases, to the temptation of believing that they will have been of no use to us, that without them we should be infinitely better off, is to forget the double aspect of sickness, annihilation and revelation, 
Sickness cuts us off from our appearances and destroys them, only the better to open us to our ultimate reality, and sometimes to the invisible. In another sense, one cannot deny that each invalid is a cheat in his own way. If he broods over his infirmities and concerns himself with them so scrupulously, it is in order not to think about death. He conjures it away by taking care of himself. Death is looked in the face only by those, and indeed they are rare, who, having understood the disadvantages of health, disdain to take measures to preserve or reconquer it. They let themselves die, gently enough, contrary to the rest who struggle and bustle and suppose they are escaping death because they haven't time to succumb to it. In the equilibrium of our faculties, it is impossible for us to perceive other worlds. Upon the slightest disorder, we raise ourselves to them. We feel them. It is as if a crevice had appeared in reality, through which we glimpse a mode of existence at the antipodes of our own. This opening, however improbable it may be objectively, we yet hesitate to reduce to a mere accident of our mind. Everything we perceive has a reality value. Once the object perceived, even if it is imaginary, is incorporated into our life. Angels, for the man who cannot avoid thinking about them, certainly exist. But when he sees them, when he imagines that they visit him, what a revolution in his being. What a crisis. A man in good health could never feel their presence, nor arrive at an exact notion of them. To imagine them is to race to one's destruction. To see them, to touch them, is to be destroyed. In certain tribes, a man suffering from convulsions is said to have the gods. He has the angels, we should say, of the man who is devoured by secret terrors. To be given over to angels or gods, well and good. Worse is to consider oneself, for long periods, the most normal man who ever lived, exempt from the flaws which afflict the others, immune from the consequences of the fall, inaccessible to divine malediction, a healthy man in every respect, constantly dominated at every moment by the impression of having strayed into a mob of maniacs and plague victims. How recover from the obsession of absolute normality? How manage to be an ordinary man, saved or fallen? Nullity objection, anything rather than this baleful perfection. If man has been able to leave the animals behind, it is doubtless because he was more exposed and more receptive to diseases than they. And if he manages to maintain himself in his present state, it is because diseases unceasingly help him to do so. They surround him more than ever and multiply, so that he should believe himself neither alone nor disinherited. They make sure he prospers, so that he should never have the sentiment that he is not provided with tribulations. Without pain, as the author of Notes from Underground saw so well, there would not be consciousness. And pain, which affects all the living, is the sole indication which permits us to suppose that consciousness is not the privilege of man. Inflict some torture upon an animal, Consider the expression of his eyes, and you will perceive a flash which projects the creature for an instant above his condition. Whatever animal it is, once it suffers, it takes a step towards us. It strives to join us, and it is impossible, while its affliction lasts, to deny it a degree, however minimal, of consciousness. Consciousness is not lucidity. Lucidity, man's monopoly, represents the conclusion of the severance process between the mind and the world. It is necessarily consciousness of consciousness. And if we distinguish ourselves from the animals, it is lucidity alone which must receive the credit or the blame. There is no such thing as an unreal pain. Pain would exist even if the world did not. If it were proved that pain has no use, we could still find one for it, that of projecting some substance into the fictions which surround us. Without pain, we should all be puppets. Without pain, no content in the world. By its mere presence, it transfigures anything, even a concept. 
everything it touches is promoted to the rank of a memory. It leaves traces in the recollection which pleasure merely grazes. A man who has suffered is a marked man, as we say that a debauchee is marked with reason, for debauchery is suffering. Pain gives a coherence to our sensations and a unity to our ego, and remains, once our certitudes are abolished, the only hope of escaping the metaphysical shipwreck. Must we now go further still, and, by conferring upon it an impersonal status, assert, with Buddhism, that pain alone exists, that there is no one who suffers it? If pain possesses the privilege of subsisting in and of itself, and if the ego comes down to an illusion, then we wonder who suffers and what meaning this mechanical development to which it is reduced can have. It seems that Buddhism discovers pain everywhere only to belittle it all the more. But we, even when we admit that pain exists independently of ourselves, cannot conceive of ourselves without it, nor separate it from ourselves, from our being, of which it is the substance, even the cause. How conceive of a sensation as such without the support of the I? How imagine a suffering which is not ours? To suffer it is the substance, even the cause. How conceive of non-coincidence with the world, for suffering is the generator of intervals. And when it seizes us, we no longer identify ourselves with anything, not even with suffering. It is then that, doubly conscious, we keep vigil over our vigils. Beyond the evils we endure, which strike us down and to which we adjust ourselves more or less, there are others which we desire as much by instinct as by calculation. An insistent thirst summons them as if we were afraid that, ceasing to suffer, there would be nothing to hold on to. We need a reassuring datum. We wait to be given proof that we are touching something solid, that we are not divigating wide of the mark. Pain, any pain, fills this role, and when we have it within reach, we know with certainty that something exists. We can counter the world's flagrant unreality only by sensations, which explains why, when we are convinced that nothing affords any foundation, we cling to all that offers a positive content, to all that makes us suffer. The man who has passed through the void will see in each painful sensation a providential sucker, and what he most fears is to devour it, to exhaust it too quickly, and to relapse into the state of dispossession and absence from which it had rescued him. Since he lives in a sterile laceration, he knows to satiety the disaster of tormenting himself without torments, of suffering without pain, and therefore he dreams of a series of precise, determined ordeals which free him from that intolerable vagueness, from that crucifying vacancy in which nothing is profitable, in which he advances to no purpose, following the rhythm of a long and insubstantial agony. The void, infinite impasse, longs to set limits to itself, and it is out of hunger for boundaries that it flings itself upon the first pain to appear, upon any sensation likely to wrest it from the pangs of the indefinite. This is because pain, circumscribed and hostile to the vague, is always charged with a meaning, even a negative one, whereas the void is too vast to be able to contain any at all. The evils which overwhelm us, the involuntary ones, are much more frequent and more real than the others. They are also the evils before which we are most helpless. Accept them, escape them. We do not know how to react, and yet it is the one thing that matters. Pascal was right not to dwell upon diseases, but upon the use they were to be put to. Yet it is impossible to follow him when he assures us that the ills of the body are merely the punishment for and the entire representation of the ills of the soul. The assertion is so gratuitous that, to contradict it, we need merely look around us. Obviously, disease strikes innocent and guilty alike. It even shows a visible predilection for the innocent, which is, moreover, to be expected. Innocence, 
internal purity, almost always supposing a weak constitution. No doubt about it. Providence takes no particular pains with the delicate. Causes, rather than reflections of our spiritual ills, our physical ills determine our vision of things and decide the direction our ideas will take. Pascal's formula is true, provided we reverse it. No trace of moral necessity nor of equity in the distribution of health and disease. Should this annoy us? Must we fall into the exaggerations of a Job? It is futile to rebel against pain. On the other hand, resignation is no longer in fashion. Does it not refuse to flatter, to embellish our miseries? One does not de-poeticize hell with impunity. Resignation is not only out of date, it is even doomed. A virtue which corresponds to none of our weaknesses. Once we commit ourselves to a passion, noble or sordid, it is of no importance, we are certain to proceed from torment to torment. The very aptitude to endure them shows that we are predestined to suffer. We love only because, unconsciously, we have renounced happiness. The Brahmanic adage is irrefutable. Each time you create a new tie, you drive another pain, like a nail, into your heart. Everything that fires our blood, everything that gives us the impression of living, of being a part of being, inevitably turns to suffering. A passion is in and of itself a punishment. The man who surrenders to it, even if he supposes himself the happiest man in the world, expiates by anxiety his real or imagined happiness. Passion attributes dimensions to what has none, makes an idol or a monster out of a shadow, being a sin against the true weight of beings, of things. Passion is also a cruelty toward others and toward oneself, for one cannot experience it without torturing, without torturing oneself. Outside of insensibility and perhaps of scorn, everything is pain, even pleasure, pleasure especially, whose function does not consist in dispelling pain, but in preparing it. Even admitting that it does not aim so high and that it merely leads to disappointment, what better proof of its inadequacies, of its lack of intensity, its lack of existence? Around pleasure, indeed, there is an atmosphere of imposture we never find in the vicinity of pain. Pleasure promises everything and offers nothing. It is of the same stuff as desire. Now, unsatisfied desire is suffering. There is pleasure only during satisfaction, and it is disappointment once satisfied. Since it is by sensation that disaster has crept into the world, the best thing would be to annihilate our senses, to let ourselves fall into a divine abulia. What plenitude, what expansion, when we count on the disappearance of our appetites, the quietude which endlessly dwells upon itself turns away from every horizon hostile to this rumination, from all that might tear it from the delight of feeling nothing, when we abhor equally pleasures and pains, when we are weary of them to the point of disgust, it is not of happiness, it is not of another sensation that we dream, but of a life in slow motion, consisting of impressions so imperceptible that they appear to be non-existent. The least emotion then becomes a symptom of insanity, and once we experience one, we are alarmed by it to the point of calling for help. Everything which affects us, in one way or another, being potentially suffering. Are we to conclude from this the superiority of the mineral over the organic? In that case, the sole recourse would be to reinstate as soon as possible the imperturbability of the elements though we would still have to be able to do this. Let us not forget that for an animal which has always suffered, it is incomparably easier to suffer than not to suffer. And if the saint's condition is more agreeable than the sage's, the reason for this is because it costs less to wallow in pain than to triumph over it by reflection or by pride. Since we are incapable of conquering our ills, it remains for us to cultivate them and to enjoy them. 
Such complacence would have seemed an aberration to the ancients, who admitted no pleasure higher than that of not suffering. Less reasonable, we judge differently, after twenty centuries in which convulsion was regarded as a sign of spiritual advancement. Accustomed to a racked, ruined, grimacing saviour, we are unsuited to enjoy the sprezzatura of the ancient gods, or the inexhaustible smile of a Buddha plunged into a vegetable beatitude. Nirvana, come to think of it, does it not seem to have borrowed from the plants their essential secret? We accede to deliverance only by taking as our model a form of being opposed to our own. To love suffering is to love oneself unduly. It is to want to lose nothing of what one is. It is to savour one's weaknesses. The more we brood over our kind, the more we enjoy dwelling on the question, how has man been possible? In the inventory of the factors responsible for his appearance, sickness leads the list. But for man, not only to appear, but to rise to the surface, evils from elsewhere had to be added to his own, consciousness being the consummation of a dizzying number of retarded and repressed impulses of vexations and ordeals undergone by our species, by every species. And man, after having profited by this infinity of ordeals, strives to justify them, to give them a meaning. They will not have been futile. They have prepared and announced mine more various and more intolerable than yours. He says to all other living beings, in order to console them for not achieving torments as exceptional as his.